So as you might know, in Raid, doing the Ascension Dungeons is very important. That's how you get to the next level. That's how you break through whatever barriers you have with your gear and, well, ascend. So the Ascension Dungeons are really important. Iron Twins, although that's Ascension of the Champion, the Phantom Shogun, and the Sand Devil. So I thought I would try something a little bit different. Here is a compilation video of all of the different teams that I've done for the Ascension Dungeons. This is also going to be pretty cool because you can see how my old teams were, how my old editing styles were, and you could compare them to how they are currently, how my teams and my editing are currently, which isn't that much different. I think it's a little bit more streamlined now, um, at least for these ascension videos i wanted to focus more on just putting the information out and less so on the actual editing and putting the music and everything time codes will be down below this is really easy to put together now that i'm here showing it to you it's probably one of the faster compositions out there hello everybody so i asked you guys i asked you which dungeon should I do a video guide on next? And 30 of you guys voted. Again, thank you for voting. I usually only farm Iron Twins on Sundays when it's void, because that's when you have the increased chance to get the, what do you call it, the Immortal Soul Essence. 46 seconds so far with this team. One thing to note here is Emic. We all struggled really hard to do the fusion for him. Now we finally have somewhere we can use him in Iron Twins. I have used this composition. It's an unkillable composition. I've used this team in all the different affinities and there hasn't been a single fail. We're going to go through the masteries, the builds, the gearing, the process, everything. After I do these runs, I'm going to talk to you about all the thoughts and considerations. When I followed Bronco's video, for some reason I wasn't able to get it. Uh, exactly the way that he did it, but I did some fine-tuning on my own, some testing, a lot of failures, a lot of wasted resources, but I'll go ahead and get to that a little bit later. Pain Keepers don't need to be leveled up. They don't have to be ascended or anything, they could stay three stars right out the gate. What makes the Iron Twins extremely hard, one of the harder dungeons to deal with within Raid, is that the Iron Twins has this onslaught of abilities that does mega damage to your team. I have tried compositions where you stack a lot of defense and a lot of survivability stats and a lot of healing and it, it was never completely 100% successful. Either it was only like 80-90% successful but you don't ever want to settle for those kind of statistics within raid. But it ended up getting to the point where I would just settle for stage 14 and then call it a day. As you can see here, the Iron Twins is doing a lot of damage, but not, nobody on our team is dying because we have Unkillable on. Emic is going to place the Unkillable. Painkeepers, both Painkeepers here, are going to reset each other's cooldowns. Coldheart is here for the EMHP. Geomancer is there for some extra damage. And the process repeats itself. Uh, repeats itself. It's completely unkillable. The speeds are very tight. We'll go over that. And Emic does need a certain HP threshold. We'll talk more about that a little bit later on. Another annoying thing that was really bothering me about the Iron Twins was that every time you would put debuffs on, whenever it gets to a certain threshold, the debuffs would come clean off, messing up everything. Just, there you go. He removed the debuffs just right now. So if you're struggling with this dungeon, hopefully you have the, the champions to make this work because I definitely think it's, it's worth building out. Never have to struggle, never have to work hard or struggle again to try and get Iron Twins 15 to work. This is really easy to put together now that I'm here showing it to you. Okay, generally speaking, it's about, it's just about a minute. We did 46 seconds, my world breaking record thus far. We've ran a couple keys, so it is 100% consistent. I run it on the other affinities, like I've mentioned, and and there have been no issues. Most of the damage, obviously, is coming from Geomancer's HP burn deflect damage skill. We'll go over it over everybody. Okay, here we have Emic. Emic is going to be in a regen set. At some point, Emic could potentially die, but at that point, it doesn't matter because everybody else is still going to have the unkillable up, and the Iron Twins is going to do damage that's going to get deflected to him. So even if Emic dies at the, at the very end, it doesn't matter because the run is already over. So Emic has regen, survivability stats, 
mostly just HP, a little bit of defense. Speeds are tight here. I wouldn't try to venture off outside of these stats, but if you can make it work, make it work. 251 speed, that's pretty much the only thing you have to worry about, plus HP and defense. Masteries, there are none. You don't need masteries, but what you do need is this cooldown here. So you are going to have to put books on him. Emic Trunkhearts A2 decreases the cooldown of all ally skills except this champion by one turn. And so that's what's making this work. Because then we take a look at the pain keepers here. There's this one. And, you know, the only thing that matters here is the speed. She needs to be going at 220 speed. That's the only thing that matters. This other one needs to be going at 215 speed. That's the only thing that matters. As you can see here, the A3s for these pain keepers decrease the cooldown of all ally skills as well. So that's how the other pain keeper is able to keep placing combat combat tactics as well as Emic Trunkheart being able to do his A2 and his unkillable buff throughout the entire run, making this entire run unkillable. And this also allows Geomancer and Coldheart to keep placing HP burns and doing their enemy max HP attacks throughout the entire fight, which makes this a really fast run. So not only is this an unkillable comp, it's probably one of the faster compositions out there. I mean, you saw what I was doing. I was doing it in 46 seconds with my best time, averaging about 54. I think I did on Void, I was doing about a minute. So generally speaking, sub minute to a minute. Masteries, you don't need any for masteries here. You don't need you don't even need to ascend or put anything else. Bare bones. Again, you need 250 or 220 speed for this one. Right, it doesn't matter which one is which, but 220 speed, 215 speed, those are very tight. So keep that in mind. One mistake I was making for quite some time, I wasted a lot of resources on this, and it hit me as to why it wasn't working. The books. Painkeeper needs to be booked. Both painkeepers need to be booked all the way up with their A3s. If you could save on books, only book the A3. You don't need to book the A1 or the A2. Those don't matter. Unfortunately, it didn't work that way for me. I ended up having to book everything just to get these cooldowns all the way done. Let's go over to Geomancer real quick. These are the... Uh, there's, no, there's no set pieces of gear. The only thing that really matters here is the speed, 204, and the accuracy. 528 500 plus accuracy you need a lot of accuracy the stat requirements for this dungeon is, is are pretty high you need at least i think 550 to accurately land every single time because i, I think even geomancer was getting resisted a few times but even if he does get resisted it's not a big deal like on the negative affinity for example geomancer might miss a few hp burns but it's fine he'll get it the next time it's an unkillable comp you don't really have to worry but Try to aim for a minimum of 500 accuracy. Of course, skills fully booked. I was using this Geomancer before on Hydra. So he does have masteries. If you're lacking in accuracy, come down here to the Eagle Eye. And then of course, we have Cold Heart. I forgot which Cold Heart it was. 215 for your second DPS, Cold Heart. And of course, that's all you need. Plus the 70% crit rate and a lot of crit damage as much as you can muster. Make sure the speed is 215. Again, the link description will be down below for his video. And she does have her skills booked. If you do get blessings on her, go ahead and go for Phantom Touch. And I showed you her masteries already. We went down for Helm Smasher. You need presets. They're very specific presets to do this. So we're going to go over the presets real quick. So as you can see, A2, second priority, A3, where he places the unkillable buff. That needs to be priority number one. Cold Heart, I just prioritize the A3. Geomancer, I turn off A2. It doesn't matter if you do or don't. You can use this. It doesn't matter. I just turn it off. A3 is what the priority is going to be. Painkeeper, pay attention here. Painkeeper, A2, priority one. A3, priority two, but open with the A3. A2, priority two. A3, Priority one. This is the faster painkeeper. The faster painkeeper is going to have this preset. The faster painkeeper, this one right here, 220. A3 is priority one. A2 is priority two. The slower painkeeper, 215 speed, slower painkeeper, priority two for the A3, priority one 
for the A2, but opening with the A2. Emek does need to be in a regen set, and ever. Let me backtrack. I don't know that he needs to be specifically in a in a regen set. And an immortal set, he seems to be doing fine without the immortal, but I think a regen set helps keep him alive. So you want him to survive as much as possible. Iron Twins is really hard. Again, this works for all affinities and it's pretty fast. So have a good day, have a good life. Peace. Alright, so Polarium reworked blessings, and we have not only a bigger PP size. Which, by the way, if you guys haven't noticed, our PP size has, has increased. My PP size was at 12 million, and now I have a PP size of 14 million. But they reworked the blessing system, so now we're getting huge boosts to a lot of our stuff. So, for an example, here, Opardum. Let's look at Opardum real quick. So, like, we're getting an extra 38% crit damage. So, if you have a high level blessing, for an example, on my Nuke Wukong, that's an extra 38%. With some extra attack that's that's insane imagine putting that on somebody like taurus like an extra 38 would be huge here almost at 340 350 some wukong's at three almost 350 for crit damage at 7.2 like it's just it's just insane with these blessings you're gonna want to farm iron twins uh, somebody came on stream and told me that hey polarium basically created centranos and the requirements to have higher blessings and then they reworked the blessings to make them even better to entice more people to buy soul stones. That's why doing the Iron Twins is going to be that much more important. So that you can collect your mortal soul stones and your coins. And whenever you see something pop up in the soul merchant market, you might be able to buy it. These are what's important, the immortal soul essences, so that you can buy your, your blessings up to, I think, like level four. And then from five to six, you start using the eternal soul essences. But you get that from doing Iron Twins. Not the easiest place to farm, but again, this is sort of more end game. And this is the team that I have right here. This team, again, I got from Bronco. Yeah, yeah, All yeah, these yeah. compositions come from Bronco. Yeah, I would definitely go ahead and, and uh, sure give him a like, go check him out. Great content, great guy. Amiable and really nice and giving me tips on how to make my videos better. So huge shout out to Bronco. I'm going to go ahead and run it and then we'll show you, we'll talk you through it. Emic is going to start out by placing the taunt and the unkillable on the entire team. We have Geomancer to place the HP burns. We have Painkeepers in here to reset the cooldowns on everybody. And then also Emic is going to be resetting people's cooldowns whenever they get hit with the shield. And then we have Cold Heart to do the enemy max HP move. And this process resets itself and continues the entire time. And this is how you cheese the Iron Twins. This works on all affinities. Uh, as far as getting here to stage 15, there are other comps out there. I haven't really stepped down from doing... This is such a jaded thing for me to say. I haven't stepped down from doing stage 15, yada yada. I was doing stage 14 for quite some time before I saw Bronco's video on how to uh, cheese using Emic. If you don't have Emic, I'm sorry. But this is basically the run here. Pretty decent amount of times. Granted, I do not usually farm Iron Twins that much, except for only on Sundays. And the reason I usually farm Iron Twins on Sundays is because the Iron Twins... I don't know if it says it right here. Somewhere in here, I think I saw that on Sundays, they have higher drop rates for the Eternal Soul Essences and the Immortal uh, Soul Essences as well. So that's usually when I farm Iron Twins, but I know some people who do it uh, on a daily basis they just don't pay the extra gems for the extra keys so for emic we're using the a we're prioritizing his a3 then doing the a2 let me move myself here cold heart is going to be just focusing on using her a3 same thing with geomancer we're turning off his a2 just using quicksand grip his a3 where he reflex damage if you have hp burn on the iron twins Painkeeper, this is the same Painkeeper that I use in my clan boss team, right here. 51k HP, 250. So it's really nice that you can repurpose the same champion for different content. This is also the same Emic that I use, 271 Emic, 271 Emic, 271 Emic right there too. Also, same Painkeeper from the clan boss in this Iron Twins team, same one. So that's this Painkeeper right here, prioritizing the A2, then the A3, and then for Painkeeper... This isn't fully booked. You don't need to have it fully booked, but what you do need is to have the books all the way up on the cooldown skill. 
Cooldown ability needs full books. Same thing with Emic. You're going to want to have everything booked out completely as well. Painkeeper, A2, and then the A3. All right, let's start off by looking at Emic's build. So here are the pieces of gear. No particular uh, sets needed. We're just making sure he has a lot of health. But I think it doesn't really matter because the speed will make sure that the unkillable is always up right here. The taunted unkillable. And then with resetting with um, Emix moves and the painkeeper's moves, the unkillable stays up for the most part. No masteries. You don't need to have masteries. Here are my stats. If you want to look at the stats, I guess the most important thing to point out is the 271 speed. High HP. I don't know if that high HP and defense matters, though. Let's go ahead and take a look at Cold Heart. Pieces of gear for Cold Heart. Just focusing on making sure we're doing as much damage as we can with her A3. Her Heart Seeker ability. If you get a blessing on her, try Phantom Touch. As always, don't blindly copy masteries, but go ahead and feel free to blindly copy these masteries. And here are the stats. High attack, 224 speed. I've seen people use 223. I've heard 225 thrown around as well. So that is probably the, the parameters that you want to stay within. You could settle for 70% crit damage, but I just went with 100% just because of uh, Phantom Shogun. But the A3 only needs... 70% because you're getting a natural 30%, but if you're doing this, you're probably already in the end game and you already know that. 250 crit damage plus, and that's all we're going to look at for Cold Heart. So for Geomancer, here are the pieces of gear. Geomancer, all we care about is getting the right speed and making sure that we have a decent amount of accuracy. Now the stat requirements, oh, you want to have everything fully booked, so this is landing. I took Heaven Cast to increase the... I thought Heaven Cast ignored Res. Wasn't there... Did they change that? As for Blessings, I don't even know what Blessings to go for right now. Just make sure he's fully booked. Here are the Masteries. If you're struggling to get accuracy, and there is a high requirement for accuracy in this Iron Twins 15 team, you're going to want to take Eagle Eye to get extra accuracy. Go down this tree to get more accuracy as well. Get some extra stats. And Cycle of Magic. Counterattack Masteries if you want to, and uh, all of this good stuff. So the most important stats to look at here are going to be the 254 speed as well as accuracy. You're going to want to aim for 550 accuracy plus, but with my gear, I was not able to do that without breaking some big champions, which I wasn't going to do. So 254 speed, 500 accuracy is working okay with me, but uh, I have seen the Iron Twins get resisted a few times whenever Geo would try to place the HP burn. So try to aim for 550. All right, this is the pain keeper, not leveled, not ascended. You don't need any of that. All you have, all you really care about for pain keeper here is that she's going at 247 speed, and that's it. That's the only stat requirement that matters. 247 speed, not too difficult, but uh, it depends on your gear. I'll just show you guys the pieces of gear that I have, just for those who want to see the pieces of gear. Go ahead and toggle through that. It is important you guys have books. Books matter. You need this move her a3 fully booked out no masteries needed this is my pain keeper the same one that i use for clan boss same one that i use for phantom shogun here are the pieces of gear only caring uh caring about getting the speed requirement fully booked phantom uh, phantom touch here are the masteries Go ahead and look at that. And then here are the speed requirements, which is basically 250. Again, I don't know about deviating from 250. I usually just try to stick to what, what's working, and 250 seems to be what's working. It's a nice and awesome team that does not fail. It's 100% works for all affinities. Look at that, new time, 48 seconds. And if you think you're ready to farm Sand Devil 25, check this video out right here. For the longest time, I thought that doing Sand Devil was a waste of time. But it's not. 
it's really helpful. This is the team, I'm gonna go over it, but as you can see, this is pretty much it. Ninja does all the damage with his burns, Aniri is gonna keep everything alive, her passive is going to bring her back alive, and then she's going to bring Ninja back, and the process just repeats. I have been running this for six and a half hours. I've done 128 rounds. It's 100%. On average, it takes about three minutes to complete. There is no preset, you just throw it in, and their AIs are pretty good about doing everything. It is important, though, to note, Aniri needs to be in the leader position. Alright, so Tav's just telling me it's the way that the passive revive works where the passive revives the champion higher in the turn order the passive is going to revive the person who's in first position so now Aniri is the one that gets passively revived so that she can actively revive. So that's the reason. Here is Aniri. These are the stats that I have on her. 68k. I was getting away with 65 before I got the blessing on her. 273 is the speed that she's going at. Nothing else really matters. Just her HP and her defense. Make sure it's high enough for her to survive hits. You want her in regen and immortal. These are the pieces of gear that I have on her if you want to look. What's that? And then here's the, the banner and the amulet and the ring. You need to have her booked. Here are her masteries. Just go ahead and copy that. And then here's Ninja. Make him tanky enough. 3k defense. It's a little low in my opinion, but it's working. So if it's working, don't bother fixing it. 212 speed. I don't know if the speeds are that tight, but these are the numbers that work for me. So that's what I would aim for. He is too slow, but it still works because he doesn't die early. There you go. I heard it from the man himself. Tavish says he is slow, but it still works. Accuracy needs to be high pretty high not that high but high enough 500 minimum this is the gear he's in region and immortal to make sure that he survives just as well oh and look at that we can increase his hp by sending all the way look at that an extra 20 percent hp where is he at right now 71 accuracy banner defense hp here are his masteries i struggled to get him over 500 accuracy so i went over here to eagle eye so if you're struggling to reach those accuracy parameters as well with your regen immortal gear this is not a bad choice and that's pretty much it throw them in like this no presets just like that and you can run it overnight or you go to sleep and that's pretty much it anyway thanks for watching have a good day have a good night and have a good life and farm sand devil and shogun bye with the introduction of Chaos Dust, I thought it was imperative that I start actually farming stage 25, because before this, I was content doing stage 24 of both the Sand Devil and the Phantom Shogun. This team I got from Nub Raids, who actually got his team, this team that I'm showcasing right now, from Own Alone. Yeah, Own Alone. Uh, you know, I didn't get to fine-tune everything quite yet because I was trying to do all of this before the free re-gear event ended. Now, as you can see, this took, for this particular run, took 15 minutes and 37 seconds. I don't know why. Let me show you guys how the team works, and then we'll discuss everything that, that um, what do you call it, that you need to build. So, um, you know, the Sand Devil's going to wake up, or start out by smashing everybody, putting everybody to sleep, but Aniri using her passive will revive herself and then bring back Drang in time to do the HP burn. Guys, this team is not easy to build. This is actually pretty gear intensive and you have to be extremely lucky when it comes to booking Aniri. So I have to preface this and let you guys know that if you're trying to farm stage 25 using this team, you need to know it's not going to be easy, but we'll break down the stats and the builds a little bit later. So she brings back uh, Walking Tomb Drang just in time. But how could I improve this, guys? What do you guys think? Because I this is like my second or third time running this team. Like I said, I just put them together, this together last night. But, uh, you know, that 15-minute run is just way too long. This is going to be an overnight farm for me. If I want to farm Sand Devil 25, it's going to be an overnight thing for me. Which... It usually has been for the most part for me because I don't have the capabilities to do a speed run quite yet. But if you guys in the community have any suggestions for me on how to improve, I'm more than happy to hear it. I would encourage and ask this of you. So this is the entire run. Aniri brings back Walking Tomb Drang. I'm using Walking Tomb Drang instead of Ninja because Ninja is locked in to my Phantom Shogun team using War Master. So if you're going to use somebody who does a three hitter, 
you can't get away with having War Master on them because it's going to wake up the Sand Devil a little bit too soon. Technically speaking, according to Owen, I don't know if Nubs mentioned it, but according to, not Owen, according to Owen alone, the guy who made this comp, you can use anybody. In fact, he used Raglan in his video, uh, but of course it was going to take a long time. So you can use anybody you want. Just keep in mind that if you have a multi-hitter, you could get away with like somebody doing uh, two hits, but three hits would be too tricky. In fact, it might even fail because you're waking up the Sand Devil and turning things out of order. So we're using Walking Tomb Dreng here. And the reason I'm using Walking Tomb Dreng is because he only hits once and his HP burns are irresistible. You will see Walking Tomb Dreng does not have any gear on him except for his speed boots. Because if I didn't put the speed boots, he would go too slow, unable to put up the burns before the Sand Devil wakes up. So that's why I you know, have him in just boots, but he's not built with accuracy. He doesn't need accuracy. It's one of the best things about Walking Tomb Dreng. Uh, another thing to note, if you are going to use Walking Tomb Dreng, Keep in mind that whoever you use as your damage dealer for this comp, they need to be squishy enough to die. So, like, let's say you wanted to throw in Ninja, but he was too tanky. Or if you wanted to use WTD, but he was too tanky because he is an HP-based champion, if he doesn't die, it's going to throw things out of order. And what I have found was that sometimes uh, Walking Tomb Dragon will be the one who's revived or she ends up reviving one of these food champions that are down here on the ground and you don't want that to happen so make sure that whoever you're using is somebody who is squishy enough to die but this is basically the entire run and we'll we'll break down everything in a little bit it's it's pretty nice it, it's it feels good to finally start farming sand devil 25 <laughs> and uh, phantom shogun 25 which i'll be doing my video for uh, him next but yeah this is usually if it doesn't if, i don't know what happened on that 15 minute run almost 16 minute run but usually this is like a four minute run plus i'm pretty sure ninja would would do it a lot faster just because he explodes his poisons not his poisons his hp burns and he does like three of them i was thinking about using artak but my Artak is closed in, is locked into my ice, hard ice golem team. Yeah, so we're looking at a four or five minute run. Four and a half minute run. Okay, so uh, there it is. 188 turns, not the best, but look at that. This is the third time I run this and, you know, I'm getting the Chaos Dust, which is, it's huge. Because you're able to go to certain champions and like rework um, your. If I wanted to rework this res and instead put put um, extra attack, I, I could. I can rework it and get extra attack on my Rotos. That's defense. Watch me just. There it is. An extra 20% for attack on Rotos. Now, I don't know if I should go for HP percent, but we're going to take it because now my Rotos is at 6.4. That's pretty nice. Uh, let me know if what, what you guys think. I haven't done research on Rotus yet to know if it's better to have, you know, HP or attack. I think I knew at one point, or I, I did some research, and then I was supposed to do a champion god on him, but completely forgot. Let's go ahead and show you guys the full outlook on everything. In his video, he did not, or he showed one where you didn't have to use. He said you basically don't have to use a preset, but if you use somebody who does healing, which Walking Tomb Drang does, WTD does have an equalizing HP balance move, uh, you're going to want to turn that off. So that's what I've done here. But again, you could just throw in, for example, Ninja and or Ninja right here and Aniri. This is important here, guys. You guys have to know this. Aniri needs to be in the leader uh, leadership position right here. She needs. To, this is the position number one. This is the leadership position. She needs to be right here. The person that you want... To revive has to be in position number one. So I'm not sure as to why that is what it is, but it is what it is, and you need to abide by it if you want this to work. And here are the presets. Aniri doesn't have to do anything. I don't know if she should do something because, uh, you know, we saw that 15 minute run. We don't want that to happen again. Uh, somebody please let me know what I did wrong there. 
But we turned off this, and that's it. The other, the food doesn't matter. Uh, Neri, you don't have to do anything. Dreng, you just turn this off so that he only does his HP burns. Can't be resisted. And let me show you guys their builds real quick. Thank you for 761 subs. So I do have two Aniris, and this was my Aniri that I was using for stage 24. The reason I couldn't use this Aniri is because she was fully booked. You do not want to have Aniri fully booked. It's not going to work. There's a very specific booking order that requires you to be extremely fucking lucky, okay? You guys, if you want this specific comp to work, the books have to land exactly the way that this is right here. For, for the specifically for her A3, Rise to Glory, and for her passive, Guardian Angel, it needs to be booked maximum minimum of two. From, from what I'm understanding, from what I've even tested, this needs to be at level three, and this needs to be at level three exactly. Because I've tried it with one more, and one more here, where it's completely maxed out. For example, with this one, completely maxed out, it doesn't work. The turn orders were off. Initially, I was looking at Saf's video, and he only had a maximum of one here, I think. And then for the passive, I think there was only like one here as well. You have to get very lucky, because you can't control where the books go. So you could end up with you know, three here and then like one here, but you you pretty much get messed up. I got extremely lucky to land where I got it, but you can only have them right here at three, here at level three. So that's important. If, you know, you, you mess that up, then I don't know what to tell you about any all other alternatives. If it happens to not land in your favor, uh, you know, I don't know what to tell you. Uh, it, you're just kind of SOL and that is what it is. And you probably have to wait for another Aniri. All right, so when it comes to kidding Godseeker Aniri out, you're going to want her in regeneration because you want her to be healing herself. And then you could use an immortal set if you wanted to, but according to Saf, and I think I agree with this, it's better to use a defiant set where you get an extra 10% of defense and a decrease of 15%. You know, the Sand Devil does AO AoE moves and it hits pretty hard. So what you want is to consider the EHP. Saf talks about effective HP. You know, I didn't understand, you know, it kind of went over my head, but I think I kind of understand it. The Sand Devil is going to take away your maximum HP, effectively reducing the amount of heals that you're going to be healing by with your regen set. You're going to want to look right here at the effective HP and then go with that. So while it is nice to have a lot of HP, you're also going to want to have a good balance of defense and not neglect defense at all. In fact, defense will help to, I think what Saf says, is reduce the amount of damage taken altogether so that more of the max HP doesn't get stripped away. I don't know, I would say go go check his video out because he's so much better at explaining this than I am. But you could use an Immortal set because Own alone's the originator of this comp, uh, as far as I know, used Immortal and Regen. Here are the stats that are working for me. I have 69k HP, 4500 defense, 249 speed. I do not know if there is wiggle room in terms of the speeds. 249 is what uh, you know I've been going by based on the videos that, that I've been seeing and 249 seems to be working from his video. The other stats don't matter. So you want them, you want Godseeker Aniri to survive and then also to be at that exact speed. Here are her masteries. Did I show you guys masteries? I think I showed you guys Masters, but I didn't go over it. So here are the Masteries. The reason we're taking Res over extra defense and going for Blast Proof is because Saf said in his video that the critical hits from the Sand Devil is what is going to kill you. So we're taking Improved Parry to decrease the damage this champion receives by 8% when hit with a critical hit to help you survive a lot better because this is an 8% versus just 5% from AoEs. So that's why we're taking that. We're taking increased healing, shadow healing, because as Saf mentioned, the Sand Devil is going to heal, I think, and you're going to want to heal with the Sand Devil. Resurgent. Definitely take Delayed Death for some extra damage mitigation up to 6%. And then you can take your Counter-Attack Masteries. Spirit Haste is what you're going to want to take from the Support Tree. With your Dead Food... You're going to have Aniri go a lot faster, and that's what makes this composition work. And then we're taking extra HP. Walking Tomb Dreng has basically nothing except 
these two pieces of gear. You don't need to have an immortal set. I just wanted to match them together. What does matter is having a speed boot so he can go fast enough to make a move whenever he's revived before the Sand Devil comes back. Yeah, so this is what I have on Walking Tomb Drang. Uh, basically nothing. You just want him fast enough to make a move before the Sand Devil wakes up and so that he can place his HP burns, which is irresistible. So even outside of the Sand Devil, if you wanted to build Walking Tomb Drang, you could build him with no accuracy. He doesn't need it. These are the masteries. I don't think they matter because he just comes back for the one turn to place the HP burns. But you can, you can copy this if you want to, but I don't think it's necessary. We don't have to worry about War Master on WTD because his A2 that places the HP burn is only a one-hitter, so you're fine doing this. I do have Brimstone on him. If it ever does proc, uh, you know, it'll help. And if you want to see my new Phantom Shogun 25 team, check this video out right here. Today I'm going to be showing you guys my Phantom Shogun 24 team. We're going to go over the builds, the presets, the masteries, and I'll talk about a few important points here and there. Using Nut, Kaimar, Riho, and then Cold Hearts. So we'll start with Nut. Before I begin any of that, I need to shout out Birdbrain. This is Birdbrain's composition. He's the one that gave me this composition. This is his team. I just asked him for it. He was more than willing to share the stats and everything. Okay, Nut. So here are the stats for Nut. 40k HP, 4200 defense, 252 speed, 100. Make sure you have him uh, crit capped. And then 269 crit damage. These are the pieces of gear that I have on him. If you want to go ahead and take a look to compare. Crit damage, ascension been farming sand devil and here are the accessories make sure that you have everything booked because the increased damage from the books are very helpful here, these are the masteries go ahead and take a look at it copy it uh, you might find something better but this is what works for me let's go ahead and take a look at riho here are her stats almost 60k hp a little bit of a defense but none of this really matters what matters is the speed and the accuracy 279 speed 584 accuracy you could probably go higher or you it would be it would behoove you to go higher but you could probably get away with like 5 550 accuracy these are the masteries and she is not booked you do not need books on Riho she works just fine without books and these are the pieces of gear that I have on her if you want to take a look at this and compare. I also use Riho in my hard 10 spider team. I don't change the builds for her or anything, she works just fine in both. We're going to take a look at Kaimar. I actually broke my arena Kaimar, this is the Kaimar I was using in arena. He was going at like 300 something speed and almost 700 accuracy, but I broke him just so I could farm Phantom Shogun 24. You need to make sure that your Kaimar is surviving. So I have him at 67,000 HP and 3.4k or 3,400 defense. You want to make sure that he's not dying on the first hit. The Shogun is going to, because um, the, the Shogun is going to target Kaimar because he has the highest crit damage and you want him to have the highest crit damage. So I have him built a little bit tankier than I normally would so that he survives the first hit. As you guys will see on the second hit, Kaimar will come close to dying, but by then it won't really matter because he will he will have had reset. The Cold Hearts and Nut would have killed Phantom Shogun by then. So it really only matters that you survive the first hit. And these are the stats that I have for him to survive. 67k HP, 3400 defense, 257 speed, 282 crit damage, and 500 accuracy. The accuracy doesn't matter too much, but I am going to try and squeeze him in for 3v3 in Arena. And I also use him in the hard Doom Towers. He is part of my hard DT floor clearing wave team. But Birdbrain actually has his Kaimar going slower. So his is going at 227, 275 crit, and just about 70k HP as well. So these are the stats that are working for him. If you can make it work, go ahead and make it work. These are the pieces of gear. I was actually only able to get to the stats that I needed because I was farming Sand Devil and I was able to get the extra 20% defense and a little bit of extra HP here and here. I need to farm some more. These are the masteries. 
you could probably change it up. Again, I, this was an arena build, fully booked, of course. And I think cold hearts are the ones that are left. Right, these two cold hearts are pretty much the same, so I'll just show you the first one, save time, fully booked, 30k HP, 5.8k attack, 250, I think the other one is at 254 speed, 70 crit only for both of them, that's all you need. And about 232, I think the other one is at 240 crit damage, but that's those are the stats. You only need 70 crit because her, her A3 will only require 70%. And these are the pieces of gear that we have on her. And I'll show you the masters real quick. Here are the masters. All right, let's talk about the turn order. These are the presets I have for my Pokemon. Open with the A1 for Nut. Open, because Kaimar is going faster than everybody else, you're gonna wanna make sure that he opens with his A1 and then for the second turn around. I'll show you, I'll talk about it, but just make sure you prioritize A1. And for Riho, we are opening with pressure points to make sure that she places the decreased defense and the weaken on Shogun, as well as the decreased attack and decreased crit rate. And then we're going to heal on the second time around. And we're also most importantly placing the, or removing all debuffs that the Shogun is going to place and then placing a block debuffs, but also healing. But the most important thing is that Riho removes the debuffs from the allies because Enfeeble is going to mess up your damage. Cold Hearts, pretty simple, straightforward. A3s, close out the A2s if you want. But that's pretty much it. Let's go ahead and I'll, I'll talk you through what's happening. Target Kaimar. He targets Kaimar because he has the highest crit damage and Kaimar's gonna tank it. Everybody's gonna use their enemy HP, their EHP moves, enemy max HP, and Riho cleanses to remove the, the, the debuff. 18 seconds, my best time is 16 seconds. We'll run it again just to show uh, you guys. Places the decreased defense, weaken. And 409855 is the max crit damage that you can do for enemy max HP in the dungeons. So I don't know what the exact number is for crit damage to attain 409, but these are the numbers that are working for me with the crit damage, 269. Cold Hearts were doing it too. They were doing it at 232. So you could probably get away if you're building these teams, you could pro or whoever you're using for your enemy max HP attack, you could probably get away with 230. I don't know if it's because I also have almost 5K. Well, this is four. So you could probably get away with something like 4K attack or defense and then 232. Well, 230 crit damage is what's working for me. We'll run it again just so you guys can see. Place the debuffs. Kaimar's going fast, so we want it to open with the A1. These three guys are going to do their enemy max HP moves. And when Shogun attacks, he places the Enfeeble debuff. So if you have Enfeeble on you, you end up weak hitting. Um, and if they get hit a second time with Enfeeble, it gets spread. And it is only protected on the first champ. The other issue I was running into was the Shade Counter. When it reaches 30, when this Shade Counter reaches 30, Akumori will not receive damage from skills or masteries scaled off of his max HP. So you kind of need Awakening or Blessings, I think. Weak hits increase shade counters. Big shade numbers equals bad. High level blessings decrease the counter. Low level no blessings do nothing. So if you have high level, high blessing Pokemon, make sure you're using them. As you can see, that's pretty much it. 16, 16 seconds. Big shout out to Bird again for giving me the uh, team composition. Thank you guys for watching the video. Have a good day or night and have a good life. Peace. Hey, how's it going, everybody? We have a video request. I am doing a video for No I Meganoid, No Boy Farchi. Um, and he says, with Kaimar, to my, my last Shogun video, doing Shogun 24 and 16 seconds, he says, with Kaimar, aha ha ha ha, it's simple. You were a bluff, try without him. So, to his uh, respectful request for me to do a video, here is a video showcasing not Shogun 24, but this time Shogun 25, 
um, without Kaimar, in fact, without any resets. So let's get right into it. I'm gonna show you the run. And here we are, 25. My best time is 25 seconds here, but that's with a reset. So let's go over this. Gnarl Horn, Paragon, Cold Heart, Cardiel, and Rhonda. I'll show you guys everything. We'll show you the run. We'll get right into it. And I'll talk through some stuff here, and then I'll show you guys the presets, and then I'll show you guys the builds in the event that you want to go ahead and check this out. Now, Shogun is going to, you know, if you're familiar with Shogun, um, cool. I am going to talk about everything for people who might not know. Now, I normally farm Shogun 24 because it only takes about 16 seconds for me, 16 to 18 seconds. And I figure, um, you know, if I if I was lucky enough to have something that could speed something up for me and make my my time more efficient, uh, why not do that? It's like telling somebody, hey, why are you using a car to go to work? Because it's faster, it's easier because I, I have it. But anyway, um, the Shogun will place the Enfeeble debuff right here. You can see it's protected. And it's going to go on Gnarlhorn here. Now, Gnarlhorn is really effective because he, on his A1, cannot place weak hits. One of the things about Shogun that makes him very difficult to deal with and manage is his, um, is his shade counter right here. Every time you weak hit, for an example, you will increase his shade counter. And when it comes to his shade counter, the more shade he has, the harder it gets to, to deal with, next to impossible even. Real quick, I forgot to mention as I'm editing this video, you need to make sure to do your best to keep his shade counter under 10. If he attacks you while the shade counter is above 10, his turn meter is going to increase, throwing off this entire unkillable comp. I forgot to mention that, keep that in mind. So Gnarlhorn, even though he is negative affinity, he will not place a weak hit. So the shade counter will stay low. Gnarlhorn here has the highest crit damage. He needs to be the one who has the highest crit damage because he is the one that's going to take the protected debuff. The Shogun is always going to target the person with the highest um, crit damage on the team. Unless you have other champions here who have low enough HP where if the Shogun thinks that he can um, one-shot them, he will. Uh, before I, this is going to repeat the entire time, but before I get to that, I want to give a big mad shout out to Biohack, IR, uh, Biohack RSL. He was the one who came up with this, and I'm pretty sure he was the one that came up, up with it. Um, go ahead, I'm going to drop a link down below, give him a like, give him a follow. He goes well in depth on this video here. I definitely recommend uh, checking him out. Go ahead, subscribe to him. Amazing content creation. This is an amazing team. I just took this team and kind of made it my own. The thing about this is you kind of need... There, it's kind of messed up, but you have to have the blessings. If you don't have enough blessings, you're not going to be able to keep this down. But you can definitely use only rares. I mean, he he himself says that you can do it re with Reliqui uh, Reliquary Tender, Aethel, Gnarlhorn, Paragon, and Coldheart, but you don't have to only use them. You don't have to only use rares. You can use whatever's available to you, and I recommend that you should because your time is valuable. But he was doing this just to show you that it is possible, but he's not going to keep the team himself. But you can use whoever you wanted. I am using these guys because I have higher blessings on them. And this is what I, I needed to do in order to keep the shade counter down. Because anybody else that I tried to use, and I, I did try to use other other champions, they didn't have enough uh, blessings. I tried using Aethel, she only had like one or two blessings. And yeah. So let me go run through it again while I talk about everything. Because there's more there's more things you need to know about. So after, after the enfeeble and decreased defense gets placed, Cardiel and you can use any cleanser, it could be uh, Pytheon, it could be Reliquary Tender, but what you need to know is that they have to have their cleansing ability on a three turn cooldown. It has to be a three turn cooldown, and it has to be AoE, and it has to be all debuffs. I tried using just Uko, of course he only removed uh, one debuff, but it needs to be a, a, a champion that cleanses all debuffs for all of your team. Otherwise, it's not going to work. 
Cardio is really handy because he also brings the ally um, attack, which also helps out. In, it helps to bring the, the HP down and keep the shade counter down uh, a lot faster and a lot more efficiently. Up to, um, on top of that, he's got his passive where he can join in on an attack. Uh, Ron is the same thing. I just happen to have a really high blessing for her. I think it's like a five, five star blessing with her, but I'll, I'll show you guys later. Paragon is going to keep the unkillable debuff, or sorry, the unkillable buff on Gnarlhorn the entire time, and this perpetuates throughout the entire fight. And, or, and Cold Heart is going to, of course, do her enemy max HP move, and that's pretty much it. Cold Heart is really good for this because of her being a void. Um, you don't want to bring anybody who's negative affinity, so somebody like Nut may not work, but I have seen teams on, on the Teams of the Week section, people using like four Nuts, and I'm sure you know that works for them because they have four Nuts, or like three Acrisias. But yeah, this is how the entire thing goes. The speeds are very tight on this, so you need to make sure that your speeds are tight. But this is not unattainable. This is, this was not too hard to do. But you just have to pay attention to everything that is required within the setup. I'm, I'm talking about masteries. You want to pay attention to the masteries. You want to pay attention to the stats. You want to keep an eye on your health. Because when you're building these characters, health is extremely important so that nobody gets targeted and the target stays, or the Shogun stays targeting Gnarlhorn. And this will just go on for the entire time. I think when Bio Shack, or I almost said Bioshock, when Bio Biohack did his, it was about an eight minute run. And, but he did it, he was able to, to do it here with only rares, I thought that was pretty cool seven and a half minute run big props to that that's that takes a lot he said he got his from a calculator he put it in a calculator that he made himself uh, according to his video and he was able to put this together so that's pretty cool as you can see he too he as well has um, a good amount of blessings for his champions so if you don't have too many blessings if you're not at the point where you have um a lot of blessings you might not want to tackle this right away or work on a lower stage. And I'm gonna just let this run. It's taking a bit. But let's see here. And by the way, if any of you guys have any other video requests, I'm more than happy to take them. I just ask that you, you know, be a decent human being, be respectful. It doesn't take much to be decent or respectful. And there you go, 25. You could definitely make this a lot faster with a different team. The reason I don't do 25 is because I do 24 in 16 seconds with the other team that you guys are already familiar with. Um, this team said, it's a 16 second thing, so why wouldn't I do that? Saves a lot of time. Let me show you the presets on this. Gnarlhorn, close out everything. You only want him to attack with A1. Again, this attack cannot be strong, critical, or weak. So you don't have to worry about the shade counter going up. You need to be placing um, skills on Shogun. You need to be having some sort of direct effect on Shogun for the shade counter to decrease. So here, the war drum is not going to do anything. Placing unkillable on himself is going to be detrimental because Paragon will not place the damage control unkillable buff on Gnarlhorn if he already has unkillable. It's going to go to somebody else. So here is um, Paragon. You don't have to have life shackles on. It doesn't matter. What does matter with the shade counter is, is that you have the amount of blessings that you... Or what does matter is having a good amount of blessings. So here, every time Gnarlhorn, for example, makes a move and attacks with his A1, shade counter decreases by two. Paragon, his every time he attacks, the shade counter is gonna drop by three. Cold Heart, every time she attacks, it doesn't matter if it's a multi-hitter or a single hitter, it's going to decrease by four. It's relative to the amount of blessings or the, uh, the level of awakening that she or he has. Cold Heart, uh, you can leave this on, I just turned it off. 
so you know you, you don't have to do too much for your dps the same thing with here i just i feel like the animations were a lot faster so i turned off uh fury tremor for ronda and then cardio you want to make sure that you're opening with any cleanser that you use you want to make sure that you're opening with the a1 because they are going kind of fast the um in the beginning of the fight your your cleanser is going to open with the a1 and then the shogun is going to place the enfeeble and the decreased defense on the, your entire team and then that's when you cleanse after that let's go over the builds real quick let's start with gnarled horn another thing make sure and i have to iterate this because i made a few mistakes uh, when i was building this the blessings that you have on your champions and the masteries that you have on your champions pay attention the blessings and the masteries that you have on your champions cannot manipulate turn meter in any way it will ruin everything okay so for an example uh gnarl horn i had because i was using him in, in something else but i i had the i had um I had survival instinct on him and for the longest for quite a few runs i was wondering what was going on well this manipulates turn meter i changed it to phantom touch masteries i put no masteries on him which you could if you wanted to make the runs a little bit faster and you know go down the offense tree of course fully booked not that it matters it just it just is here are his stats whenever you're building any of these champions you want a minimum of 40k bioshock or <laughs> biohack says that all of his champions are a little over 40k in my experience 40k is sort of the minimum whenever you're approaching most of the content within raid for an example when i'm building a hydra champion 40k is the minimum so 40 for a little over 40k here for hp you do want to stack some defense speeds are tight okay i will show you guys the the speeds for everybody in a in a nice list that biohack provided in the reddit i'll link that as well but what works for me here is 183 speed. And Gnarlhorn needs to have the highest crit damage. He needs to have the highest crit damage to make sure, make sure you're checking for that. And again, here are the pieces of gear. If you want to take a look at it. I put him in triple reaction. One thing that Biohack did mention was that putting Gnarlhorn in reaction is going to be beneficial because Gnarlhorn needs to survive the first hit. So you either make him tanky enough with the stats of HP and defense for him to survive, or you can put him in reaction and hope that this 25% chance to change critical into normal when attacked um, procs. But triple turns this into 75%. All right, that's Gnarlhorn. Let's go over Coldheart. All right, this cold heart again this cold heart i use this cold heart because she has the highest amount of blessings but i'm going to change her back after i'm done with this video here are her pieces of gear prioritizing the normal um 70 crit rate high crit damage and attack with a minimum of 40k hp 58 you don't have to have it this high 206 speed again the speeds are tight Somewhere between 205 and 215 is where you want to be. 70 crit rate, 230 crit damage, nothing else matters. Let's look at our other... Um, who else was in our team? Oh, our other DPS, Rhonda, 4 star blessing. Masteries, pretty much none, but I did go for Giant Slayer. Masteries aren't too important. She's not even fully booked, but she does have the Soul Reap blessing, 4 turns. Same thing here, a minimum of 40, but it just happened in the optimizer to show 60. So uh, a good amount of HP, good amount of attack. 205 was the minimum for the speeds for your DPS. 205 to 15 is where it's at. 100% crit rate, of course, and some high crit damage, but not too high. It has to be lower. All other champions have to have lower crit damage than Gnarlhorn because Gnarlhorn is the tank. Here are the pieces of gear, um, the pieces of gear if you want to look at it. I'll go really quickly so it doesn't take up too much of your guys' time. Now let's go over, let's see, Cardio. Cardio, I broke my Cardio, I use him in Hard Fire Knight. I'm gonna put him back also. Here are his stats, HP, a little bit of defense. This is your cleanser, 286 to 287, very tight. 286 or 287 only. 286 287 only and that's pretty much the only thing that matters here you use your cleanser again your cleanser whoever you end up using has to have aoe remove all debuffs 
three turn cooldown, that's important. And of course, blessings, make sure it doesn't manipulate any turn meter. I took off masteries here just so I didn't have any turn meter issues here as well. And I think that's about it. Did I? Oh, Paragon. Okay, Paragon. The king of the cheese, as they say. He doesn't have to be in Toxic. I put him in Toxic. It was recommended if you can pull it. It's a little extra damage, makes the run go faster. Here are his stats, HP, defense, 178 speed. Paragon needs to be going at 176 to 178. Again, that is a very tight parameter to fit into. If you want to build them with more attack, if you want to build them with crit rate and a little extra damage, it can't hurt, it can only help. Nothing else really matters. HP, speed, 176 to 178, and that's it. He needs to have his books, by the way. And Blessing, I went with Phantom Touch. Masteries, this is pretty much it. Alright, so that is... Oh, let me show you the pieces of gear. And then that is going to be it. That's the run for stage 25. And there's that. That's going to do it for stage 25. Have a good day. Have a good life. Peace. With the introduction of Chaos Dust, it's important to run stage 25 if you're at the point where you can start doing so. This is my team for stage 25 of Phantom Shogun that I got from Boozer, and he got this from Bronco Raids. Uh, again, if you're not following Bronco, I would suggest that you do because he's always coming out with great compositions. I will link and tag them down below. I'll link this video down below as well, just so you guys can see it. Okay, so here we go into the fight. We're going to start off with having Gnarlhorn targeted, but he's got the unkillable, so it doesn't matter. And then we have Emic coming up with a taunt. We have Painkeepers resetting the skill cooldowns so that we can keep this continuous loop going on. Then we have Ninja coming in with his HP burns, and then we have a Cold Heart to do the enemy max HP moves. And this process just repeats itself over and over again. And this hasn't failed. I've run this quite a few times, several times so far. In fact, I did this team, a, a variation of this team, I think last year. But I had gotten a comp from Biohack. Not Bi yeah, Biohack. Biohack RSL is another content creator. And originally I looked at his video and then I put a team together. I don't remember if it was the same team as this one. But I know that this team I got from Boozer who got it from... Bronco. But this is the team here, and we're going to go ahead and dive right in. So let's go ahead and start off with the presets. Thank you for 761 subs. Gnarl Horn is just going to close off his A2, open up with his A3, put up his unkillable. Then Painkeeper is going to. This is the same Painkeeper, by the way, that I use in my clan boss team. So this right here, going 250 speed, 51k HP. Where's my clan boss team? Same same peep, uh, pain keeper right here, 250 speed, 51k HP. So that's pretty nice. I thought I was gonna have to remove my uh, like keep switching gears around, but now this pain keeper is doing the same thing for both. Uh, we're closing off the A2, opening up with the A3, or just uh, you know prioritizing the A3. Make sure that pain keeper is booked. Pain keeper needs to be booked. If you're using this pain keeper in clan boss, then you're gonna have her booked fully up anyway but you're gonna want to have everybody booked by the way i have to point that out because i remember when i was doing bio hawk uh, biohacks video um for stage 25 of phantom shogun i was like beating my head over i was like what's going on what's wrong and it turned out i wasn't having i didn't have pain keepers booked or gnarled horn booked all the way uh cold heart just closing out the a2 you don't have to close out the a2 if you don't want to but she's just there for her pain seeker or yeah her heart seeker ability Ninja, prioritize one on the A2 and then two on the A3. Emic is going to do a uh, prioritizing number one for A3 and then A2 for A2. So he puts up his taunt and unkillable ability and then he puts up his shield and the shield is going to decrease the cooldowns of everybody else and then Painkeeper helps to reduce the cooldowns of everybody else. And that's what keeps this going. So there's two things you have to note about Gnarled Horn. He needs to be tanky enough to survive the first hit. 
and he also needs to have the highest crit damage on your team he needs to have the highest crit damage so 72k hp 3.8 for the defense and then 260 crit damage so he needs to have survivability stats you could also put him in a reaction set a re or reaction gear reaction gear will have a 25 percent chance i think it goes it's going to go all the way up to 75 percent if you have three pieces but this will change the critical hit to a normal hit to help him survive you could do that or you could just try to build him as tanky as possible here are the pieces of gear sorry i almost neglected that focusing on hp and defense And having the highest amount of crit damage. The reason you want high crit damage on Gnarlhorn is because you want him to be the target. And the Phantom Shogun is going to prioritize the person with the highest crit damage. So again, high HP, high defense, high crit damage. 173 speed is the speed that you need. So keep that in mind. Nothing else matters. You could take Faultless Defense for some extra HP. And to reflect a portion of... The damage reflected, but I don't know that it is necessary. I think I saw uh, Boozer put this on. I forgot who I saw put this on, but somebody put it on and I was like, I'm copying that. Here are the Masteries. There are no Masteries, but you could have Masteries. Let's go ahead and take a look at Painkeeper, who was the next one I remember. Like I said, the same build that I used for Clan Boss. Fully booked. We have Phantom Touch. These are the Masteries that I have on her. Now, the only thing that I think matters when it comes to Painkeeper is the speed. The speed, I don't know what the wiggle room is. But anyway, 250 speed is where Painkeeper needs to be at. I don't know that the other stats matter. I don't think they do. But 250 speed is, is just basically what you're looking for. Alright, big boy Emic himself. Basically should just call himself 271 Bronco. Because for a lot of Bronco's compositions, it's at 271 speed for Emic. And I think that's pretty funny. When we're talking about Emic, I think the most important thing is that he is tanky enough. So a lot of HP, a decent amount of defense, and of course 271 speed. I have seen people use him in a regen set, but I think that the, the most important thing to, to remember is 271 speed. I don't know if there's wiggle room for that. I, I wouldn't deviate from it, but if you do, let me know. And then high HP and defense. Pieces of gear on Emic. Real quick. Skills needs to be fully booked. And if you got blessings on him, I'm not exactly sure what blessing I would put on him, but maybe Brimstone. When in doubt, I Brimstone out. Here are the Masteries. There are no Masteries, but you could if you wanted to. 271 speed, high HP. Let's look at Cold Heart. Is it this one 224 yeah there it is all right so in boozer's video and i think someone else's video i saw that cold heart was running at 223 speed but for this cold heart we're running at 224 the the set doesn't really matter you do want to have everything booked if you have a blessing go ahead and put phantom touch here are the masteries we're taking helm smasher and that's basically it i'm pretty sure you could change the masteries Again, don't blindly copy Masteries, but you can go ahead and blindly copy Masteries. I'm choosing to use this Cold Heart because this Cold Heart has the highest amount of blessings on my account. And as you know, the more blessings you have, the better. So you can reduce the, the counter on Phantom Shogun. So we have 5k, a little over 5k attack, 224 speed, 100% crit rate, and 250 crit damage. Just about where we want her. But the 224 speed is what we want here. And of course the damage stats because we want to max out, to cap out on the damage with her A3, Heartseeker ability. So I, I'm thinking 223, 224 works. I think someone said 225 works as well, but I'm not exactly sure what the parameters are there. Attack, crit damage, speed. Okay, Ninja. Immortal, accuracy, I don't think it matters though. This is just what, what came out of it. Here are the pieces of gear if you want to look. So when it comes to Ninja, I think the most important thing is that he is with high accuracy. So here he is at 60k HP, 4.2 attack, 
251 speed is what's working, so I would stick with that. And then 600 plus accuracy. I think 605 is the minimum needed. So when you're building Ninja, the most important thing is having accuracy. Again, guys, these are just stats to work towards. I understand that it's pretty hard to attain these stats, but it's just something to work towards. This is an end game uh, boss. It's This is end game content. So, you know, for somebody who either pay, pays to win or has been playing for years, this might be viable for, for most of the people within that, um, I guess, uh, umbrella. But for many people, this is probably not going to be the easiest thing. Uh, again, this is not an easy build. It's very gear intensive. Yeah, so just the most important thing about Ninja or whoever you're going to use, if you're placing debuffs, then you're going to want high accuracy. I don't think that using a Krizia or Nut will help because the Phantom Shogun has a passive that reduces the amount of damage from multi-hitters by a certain extent with each consecutive hit. Unless you're one of these guys with a bunch of Nuts and a bunch of Krizias. Ninja is fully booked. If you can get Brimstone on him, get Brimstone on him. Here are the masteries, just so you guys can check, take a look at that. And if you guys want to see my new Iron Twins 15 team, check this video out right here. Yeah, so if you made it all the way to the end here, and you've been a longtime supporter of my content, then you will probably notice the difference, the change, the progression, the evolution, if you will, from how I used to do my videos versus now. My videos in the beginning were really short, and they had well, like louder music to them, more, I guess, pop-up edited editing type things and i always used to end my videos by saying have a good day have a good life or good night peace something like that and another thing was before i don't think i was that comfortable talking to the camera however after doing this for something like a year now i feel a little bit more comfortable confident talking to the camera i feel more you know just into the jive of things and that i think that just comes naturally with doing this YouTube camera thing for quite some time. Also, it's a little bit more noticeable. The camera quality and my mic got better. That was pretty fun. Have a good day. Have a good night. Peace. Oh, I forgot to say have a good life. Peace.